first time in my YouTube life, somebody has responded to one of my videos. Let's take a look at it. Real quick before we get into it, I have more than twice as many subscribers as I did this time last week. So, to all my new unholy friends, hi, welcome. I'm really nervous because there's so many more of you. Alright, let's get into it. This blog was written in response to one of my early videos. One of the ones I put out within the first like two months of starting YouTube. It was called Doubts I Shouldn't Have Ignored as a Christian. The blog attempts to answer some of these doubts. The way this blog starts off is very telling. In this post, I'm responding to Unholy Sarah's video titled, Doubts I Shouldn't Have Dismissed as a Christian. Sarah says that as a Christian, she had doubts and she would push these doubts out of her mind when she didn't get a satisfactory answer. In my response, I will provide answers to the doubts she has raised. But of course, whether she finds my answers satisfactory is entirely up to her. The way this is worded is very dismissive. They're giving me the answers and if I don't find them satisfactory, that's on me because it couldn't possibly be that, that I have any sort of legitimate reason to question these. They're airtight. What they're really doing here is just dismissing any concerns I could possibly have before I even have a chance to say them. So yeah, that's, that's great. Anyway, my first point was this. Number one. Why did God treat his most loyal servants so poorly? This disturbed me a lot as a teenager because God was so ready to just ruin the life of somebody who worshipped and praised him regularly. Wow, that was painful to watch. Let's not do that again. The writer starts off like this. Here we ask the question that Job attempts to address, namely, why does God allow terrible things to happen to good people? That is not what I asked, although we can get to that point as well. It's not that Job was a good person, although I'm sure he was a nice enough dude. It's just, that's not it. Job was loyal. Job did everything God wanted of him, and he was rewarded with pain and misery. And for what? A bet? God just wanted to boast to Satan about Job's loyalty, and for that reason alone, he knowingly allowed for all these horrible things to happen to the dude. He even encouraged it. That is how God rewards loyalty. But let's go ahead and cover your point as well. My answer to that question is, I don't know. God has his reasons, and since he's proven himself to us through his word, his spirit, and his creation, we must be satisfied with understanding that God knows what he's doing. Really, we must be satisfied. All right, so how exactly has God proven himself? By allowing approximately 3,700 children to die every year of cancer, or by allowing about 60,000 people to die every year by natural disasters, or maybe by sitting by and watching while 433,000 people are sexually assaulted every year in the United States alone, or by watching while 3.1 million children starve to death every year. Oh wait, I know what you're talking about. The Jesus toast. Yep. That proves it. Links to charities that actually try to help with the aforementioned problems will be in the description below. Moving on. All of humanity is guilty of sin and deserves to be in hell right now. Yes, because I've definitely done things worthy of eternal damnation. Seriously, how do people actually think this? How do they think that they've done anything? Anything that is worthy of eternal torture. Think about that for a second. Eternal. Forever. No end. What could you possibly do that would be worthy of that. I wouldn't even put Bundy through that. Not eternally. But apparently, according to Yahweh, all you really have to do is be born. How dare you? We have no right to complain about the curse of suffering we have brought on ourselves through the rebellion and sin of Adam and Eve. No, I had nothing to do with Adam and Eve. There is nothing I could possibly do that would have any effect on them at all. Not now, not at any point in the past, not at any point in the future. So why is it fair to punish me for something that they did? Uh, as if it's possible for that to be a literal story anyway, but that's a topic for another day. The point is, you and I did not bring on anything done by people who lived and died thousands of years before we were ever even born. Let me ask you this. If I killed someone, maybe killed a hundred people or a thousand, did awful things to them, and then I had a baby, and I died in childbirth before I could be held accountable for my actions. Would it be fair to punish that baby for what I had done? What about the baby's kids or their grandkids or great grandkids? If it's not okay for us, why is it okay for God? 
Why are we holding God to lower moral standards than we're holding ourselves to? Next, we address what happens to people who never get the chance to meet God. Those who live in a place where maybe Christianity isn't super popular. Starting off strong, I see by quoting William Lane Craig, someone who we respect so much in the atheist YouTube community. I also see that you let him answer for you. You didn't really answer it yourself. Find whatever, it's not that long of a quote. Let's just take a look at it, shall we? God in his providence has so arranged the world that those who would respond to the gospel if they heard it, do hear it. The sovereign God has so ordered human history that as the gospel spreads out from first century Palestine, he places people in his path who would believe if they heard it. Once the gospel reaches people, God providently places there persons who he knew would respond to it if they heard it. In his love and mercy, God ensures that no one who would believe in the gospel if he heard it is born at a time and place in human history where he fails to hear it. Those who do not respond to God's general revelation in nature and consciousness and never hear the gospel would not respond to it if they did hear it. Hence, no one is lost because of historical geographical accident. Anyone who wants or even would want to be saved will all be saved. You could have said that they have a chance on the afterlife or that they're judged instead by their good and bad deeds, which would make a whole lot more sense anyway. But instead you chose this. So God in his infinite love and wisdom and power made people that he knew would not believe in him and then punishes them for not believing in him. So he makes people and then punishes them for being the way that he made them. This definitely shows how logical and loving this God is. Number three. Why does God let babies die? He starts off with, God lets babies die because we live in a sin-cursed fallen world. It's very similar to what we covered in number one. We're all cursed from birth, or how this writer put it, from conception, and we're all deserving of eternal torment. So again, we're back to being totally fine for some reason to punish a child for the things that their parents and grandparents and great, 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 whatever grandparents did. You are holding God to a lower moral standard then you are humanity. What's the point of even calling him God at this point? They did say something that caught my attention though. My understanding is that God decides if a baby's soul will go to heaven or hell based on God knowing if the baby would have grown up to believe in Jesus or not. So this was interesting because God knew already that the baby wasn't really going to get a life. And God knew that if the baby had been allowed to live, he, he knew what the baby would have chosen. So where's the free will? That was the bullshit answer I was given whenever I brought something like this up. Oh, God let this or that bad thing happen because he didn't want to interfere with our free will and that's why this and this happened. Now, I don't really necessarily believe in free will as it is, but that was like half the point of Christianity. That was like half the answers I got. This totally nullifies that. For the next point, he just links a William Lane Craig video. And if I wanted to respond to a William Lane Craig video, I would respond to a William Lane Craig video. But I'm responding to your blog, so yeah, not gonna do that. If y'all would like to see me respond to this video, let me know in the comments. It's only like three and a half minutes, so that's no problem. I'd be willing to do that. I would not, however, be willing to respond to the video he links for number six, because that's like an hour and a half, and I am not shifting through all that. Sorry, but I have more in my life than just YouTube and I have to have some time for my schoolwork and stuff. They also link away for talking about biblical slavery again. I'm responding to you, dude, so please just come up with your own answers. If I were to respond to everything you linked away to, as well as your blog post, this video would be eternal. And I actually only have 36 minutes of storage on my phone right now, so yeah, I can't do that. After responding to my sixth point, they link away to a playlist of positive reasons to be a Christian. I could see this being worth responding to as well, but I wouldn't argue that there are no positive reasons to be a Christian. But I would argue that the negative of believing in something that just isn't true or that doesn't make sense outweighs any possible positives. Lastly, I know you've encountered Mormon Sarah, which is not a part of the Christian faith, but is a cult and a false religion. Yeah, I know Mormons are a cult and I know they're a false religion, but that doesn't make them not a part of the Christian faith. As far as I'm concerned, I've always kind of thought that if they believe in Jesus and that he was the son of God and all that, then they're Christian. Although I might even go as far as to say if they identify as Christian, then they're Christian, but that's debatable. Still, the fact is that being a false religion and a cult 
doesn't make you not Christian. Remember, dude, I think that your religion is a false religion. And I still think you're a Christian. So that was the vlog. That was the first time anyone's ever responded to me. I hope you knew, blog writer dude, when you linked this in my comments that I was gonna be all sarcastic and stuff in the video response. I mean, I usually am, so you probably knew. The blog is linked in the description along with a lot of other stuff. That's all for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. If you've liked this video, go ahead and hit the like button, maybe leave a comment down below. An extra special thank you to my extraordinary patrons who are listed here and here. I'm running out of space for just one. And an extra, extra special thank you to my top tier patrons, Aided Furball, and I am so sorry because I'm probably gonna get this wrong, but Phelan Swetson... That wasn't even close. Please just correct me. I, I will do my best to practice. I'll practice in the mirror and stuff. I'll get it right for you. We just gotta talk about pronunciation. Anyway, if you would like to become an extraordinary patron or maybe hear me butcher your name, that link to my Patreon is in the description down below, along with those links to those charities again, social media, all that stuff. Subscribe if you'd like to see more content from me in the future, and as always, stay unholy, my friends.